grade, you know what to do. You can be dismissed for Children's Church. How are we out there today? I hope you're well. And if you are well, I hope I don't ruin it. A couple of things uh, before we dive into the sermon this morning. And appreciate Jim and Deb reading our scripture passage that I'll be preaching from today. So if you're in Luke 11, just stay there. And I'll be there, I'll, I'll be there with you in a moment. Uh, last Sunday afternoon, I went home and I completely uh, forgot that Monday was Veterans Day. And we did not, we did not recognize veterans. And so um, I want to take the opportunity to do that right now. So if you're a veteran, you've served in the United States military, if you would stand and just let us recognize you and thank you for your service. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't want to take for granted the freedoms that we have and those who have uh, sacrificed um, uh, various things in their lives to serve and to protect. And so uh, thank you so much. Also, a couple of weeks ago, I preached uh, a message on the Sermon on the Mount. And so I've tried to make a little, um, a little prayer help. Now, I'm, I'm still working on it, okay? So there are some of these copies out there. If you have young eyes, uh, you can take one that's out there. I'm working on one for those of us who don't have young eyes um, because my arms do not stretch that far to be able to read that. But anyway, those are out there for you. It's just um, using the Lord's Prayer as a model um, to... Uh, to pray and to um, go before the Lord, all right? So we are in Luke 11, verses 37 through 54 this morning. I want to begin with a question to you, a question to me. Have you ever hidden hurt feelings under a religious mask? Have you ever hidden hurt feelings under a mask of religion? Uh, Do any of us cover bitterness or resentment or anger or anxiety or jealousy or envy? All kinds of things that could be asked here. Do any of us ever cover these feelings and emotions underneath the shiny facade of piety? Like, I'm okay. You ever do that? I just, I'll just confess that I'm guilty of that. Right? What we have in front of us in this text is Jesus' confrontation. And, and as we'll, we'll see, uh, Jesus is in the home of a Pharisee, and he's, he's going to boldly confront this Pharisee and the rest of the Pharisees and the scribes with their pretense. He's going to confront them with their pretense uh, of the many masks used to hide hurt feelings, the mask of religion can be the most insidious because it projects an image of squeaky clean, but it hides an interior as rotten as maggots in the garbage. Here, Jesus invites this masked person, the Pharisees, and presumably there are others in the house with them, he invites them to drop the pretense and confront the issue of their heart. Okay, and so that's what we're looking at today. That's, this is what we're studying in this text. So, so the, the challenge, the encouragement for us is to drop the pretense and to let's get real. Let's get real. Um... And not hide what's going on in here with a mask of religion, a a pretense, a facade, a a falseness, a phoniness that really covers what's going on in our hearts. Sometimes you and I get stuck. I think this is true of all of us, that sometimes we get stuck because we deny the issue 
we deny that the issue lives in me and maybe not all in them. So, so a lot of times we have conflict, we have issues, we, we look at them. They, they did this to me. They, and we deny that there's an issue in here. There's an issue within us, within our hearts, within our souls that, that maybe God intends for this conflict to draw out and so that we can see it and repent of it and trust the Lord in it. So this requires us to confront the disorder and the distortions that exist within ourselves. And confronting the disorder that exists in our private world, that is in our soul, this is the deepest and most important battle that we will ever acknowledge and fight in this life. It requires humility. It requires vulnerability. It requires realness and rawness. All the things we love to be, right? No. Like we struggle with this in our human pride. We, we want to press against humility and vulnerability and, and being authentic and real. So, so not everyone is willing to do this, conf this confrontation of evil that lurks and lives within themselves. So it's, it's much easier to point out your disorder than to address my own. It's so much easier for me to see the distortions in your life, in your behavior, than it is for me to, to address the distortions that live within my heart, that live within my mind and my attitude. Right? So, so it's just, it's easier to masquerade in what appear to be outward and noble works of righteousness with a disgruntled and disordered and judgmental heart than it is to actually address what is earthly and sinful inside of us. So, so the theme statement of this text is, is in your notes. It's God cares deeply about not only what we do externally, but with who we are internally. Like we've seen this now going back into the previous chapter, even with Mary and Martha. That God... Jesus is emphasizing the more important thing, the, the heart of the matter, the, the worship of the heart, and not the externals. So, so our propensity this morning, in each of our lives, because there's a little Pharisee in all of us, our propensity is to focus on the outward and neglect the inward. To focus on the problems other people have instead of addressing our own. So in our text, we have examples of those who look good in appearance. They're intelligent regarding the law of God. They talk the right talk, but, but they are heartless. They're unmerciful. They're unkind. They're proud. They're controlling. They're demanding all the things we despise in others and yet can be woefully blind to when they exist in us. Or if we do see them in ourselves, we laugh it off and excuse it. Oh, yeah, I'm, I know I'm controlling, but that's just, that's just the way I am. That's my personality. We kind of give ourselves a pass in these areas when, when, when we won't give others a pass. So here, let's take a deep breath and let's dive in, Right? Because Jesus pronounces six woes in this text. And in verses 37 through 41, we see that the heart condition of these Pharisees and scribes is exposed. Their heart condition is exposed. The heart condition, your heart condition, and my heart condition has to be exposed. The light of the glory of the gospel and the truth of Jesus has to shine in there if we're ever going to be rid of what is earthly in us. We have to let the light, the Spirit of God, shine the light of the truth in our soul. Okay? So, so Jesus does this work, and, and man, does he do it. He exposes the condition of their heart. The occasion for what follows begins with an invitation from a Pharisee for Jesus to come and dine with him and the other guests. Jesus accepts the offer and finds himself reclining at the table of this Pharisee's home. The specific event that brings about the sharp rebuke of Jesus towards the Pharisees and the scribes is in verse 38, 
right? The Pharisee was astonished to see that he, Jesus, did not first wash before dinner. You're like, what's the deal here, right? What? To us, the incident might seem a bit silly, but to the Pharisee observing Jesus, who is now, Jesus, is now a prominent rabbi with a significant number of followers and one who is working such miraculous works, the incident to the Pharisee is shocking to his sensibilities. The word astonished is more than a simple response like, wow, Jesus didn't even wash his hands before eating. Doesn't he care about germs? Like, that's not at the heart of of what's going on inside of this Pharisee. The Pharisee's sensibilities are offended. He is offended that Jesus did not go and wash his hands before he came and reclined at the table. And he's offended not because Jesus didn't wash his hands and now he's eating with dirty hands. He's offended because Jesus has broken with the ceremonial traditions of the Pharisees. You are not keeping our man-made rules, Jesus. You're not following the protocol that we have put out for everyone to follow. You, you call yourself a teacher of the law? And you don't wash your hands before you eat? So, so we know this is the case because in Mark's gospel, in chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, there's a parenthetical statement there that Mark puts there. He says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions, Mark says, that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. So watch what Jesus does in verses 39, 40, and 41. Let's read it. The Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! You see the exclamation point there? This is an exclamatory statement. You fools! Jesus is a guest in this Pharisee's home, but he's Jesus. Now, I don't recommend that, that if somebody invites us over to dinner, that, that, we, <laughs> that we start saying, you fool, right? This is Jesus, right? Jesus, Jesus is the master teacher. He's, he is Lord. He is sovereign, and he sees the heart He sees the heart of of this Pharisee and and the Pharisees and the scribes. He knows their heart motives. He says, you fools, did did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Now, what Jesus does here is right in accordance with 2 Timothy 3.16. For the word of God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, So Jesus teaches He says, now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but neglect the inside. He's teaching them, right? Then he reproves, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. And then he corrects them. You fools, did did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And then he he instructs them. Verse 41, but give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. In other words, start with the heart. Start with the interior, start with the inside, your, your attitudes, your, your affections, your mind and where your thinking is going. Start with the inside, with your soul, and then the rest will be clean. Now, this, this has been sitting in the kitchen here at church for a little bit, and I noticed it. This week, and I, I noticed it, and I, I intentionally did not clean it out, and I will clean it up. But on the outside, it looks pretty good, right? I can't, I can't possibly walk around and show all of you what's on the inside, but I don't want to drop it. Um, as an illustration, this, what, what's on the inside is indiscernible, okay? So... So, all that, uh, uh, just a, a little bit of a living illustration. Don't, don't touch my mouth, right? 
I'll be sick next Sunday. Um, Jason will be preaching. Craig, you ready? Um, this is what Jesus is getting at, right? Clean up the inside. And this is an example of the Pharisees. They look good on the outside. They look good. But on the inside, it's anything but good. He says, you are, you are full of death. You are a grave on the inside. So, so God is consistently emphasizing heart transformation, not just outward, external, moral reformation. We need heart transformation. We need to be changed from the inside out, be cleansed, to have a pure heart. Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers, Jesus says. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Proverbs 21, 2, every Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Matthew 15, 18 and 19, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. What what defiles you? What defiles me? What, What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. It's what's in the heart that defiles For out of the heart, Jesus says, come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality and theft and false witness and slander. Like, this is alive in us. And and Paul says to the Colossians, put to death what is earthly in you. Friends, this is a day by day, moment by moment war. This is the ground of our spiritual battle. Like, killing what needs to die within me. You killing what needs to die in you by the power of the Spirit of God. We need to practice dying every day and then look for resurrection because God is the God of life. And where we die to the old, he says, put on the new. Put on the new and walk in holiness and walk in Christ and walk in the freedom of the Spirit. So so yes, there, there is death and we are called to die every single day. But listen, there are hopefully many resurrections happening in your heart and mind every single day as we die to the to the old us and we live to the new us in the spirit. So so if you have a foul mouth, the solution is not to brush your teeth. It's to ask God to change your heart. If there is a bitter or angry spirit, the solution is not fake it till you make it, but rather have God cleanse our heart through the application of his spirit so that the fruit coming out of us is the the fruit of the spirit. If you're looking at pornography, the short-term solution might be to ditch your phone and cut your television. That might be the the short-term external solution, but the real solution is to cry out to God, oh God, Cleanse my affections. Strip away from me this desire to run to this madness that is destroying my soul. If the inside of your house is filthy, the solution is not to paint the outside so it looks nice when people drive by. No, clean your house. Clean the inside of your house. So Jesus exposes their heart condition. Secondly, the impurities of the heart are detailed. Now, this is where Jesus is going to get personal, right? He details the impurities of their heart. I said in an earlier sermon a few weeks back that the word woe can, can mean a mixture of judgment and compassion. Uh, admittedly, though, it's difficult to miss the sharpness of Jesus' pronouncement of judgment towards the Pharisees and the scribes in these verses. So I don't think it's a stretch for me to say that their hypocrisy made Jesus sick because the results of their deception was so heavy and expansive on everything and everyone they came into contact with. Jesus could not have offended these people more than he would have offended them here. Those who put on a religious facade and pretend to have it all together while laying unbearable burdens on others and passing fierce judgment against those who break their traditions and man-made laws, they do more damage to others than, they, than that can be imagined. And so the truth comes screaming to the forefront as Jesus pronounces 
these judgments. There are six woes, and I've just framed them for, for us as six signs of a, an unclean or an impure heart. Sign number one is verse 42. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So the first sign of an unclean heart is that they love the secondary matters and they neglect the primary matters. They focus on the externals and they neglect the internals. And the internal is the primary heart of the matter. So this first pronouncement deals with the Pharisees' practice of extensive tithing, even in some cases carefully going beyond what the Old Testament law commanded. So, so they're tithing they're tithing mint and rue and every herb. Like they're tithing their spices. Okay? Now Jesus doesn't say they're wrong for doing that. But, but they are carefully tithing these herbs and spices. And, and yet, what are they neglecting? They're neglecting justice and the love of God. So, so Jesus doesn't rebuke their tithing. He rebukes their negligence of what's going on in their heart. They don't care about justice. They don't love God. They don't love others. The root motivation of their heart is not love for God and justice for their fellow man. Their motivation was in the appearance of what they were doing. They wanted the applause of people and the recognition so that often accompanies external religious behavior. When it's void of love and justice, Jesus says this kind of offering is unacceptable. In other words, the motive of our hearts matter. He says, you should have given your offerings without neglecting justice for others and love for God. So the primary matter is the motivation of love for God and justice for others. But, but empty religion neglects the inner matters of the motivations of the heart and focuses solely on the external matters and what appears to be. This is, they had not gotten the message of the prophet Micah. Right? Micah 6, 7, and 8, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? They miss that, that internal focus. This is not just a New Testament, this is not just a New Testament detail. All throughout the Old Testament, God cares about the heart. God wants to transform the heart. God wants our heartfelt worship, not just our external going through the motions. Religion. Sign number two of an unclean heart comes from verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the, in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. The sign is this. They love their reputation and they neglect their character. In their pride and desire to be seen by others for their righteousness, the Pharisees sought after the position. They wanted the power seat. They wanted the prestige. They wanted people to see them. They wanted the high status in their social circus. Cir circus, yes. Circles and circus. They look down their noses at the have-nots and the left. They, they are the elites. In their own mind, they are the elite. So, so they weren't interested in loving and helping others, but rather their focus was on loving themselves and seeking for themselves the greatest position. Jesus says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So the temptation to live seeking to be seen and approved by others is common to man. It's common to us as humans. It is an especially insidious temptation for those who, who hold some prominent position, especially in religious circles, pastors, preachers, missionaries. Like there is, there is an insidious temptation that lives in, in those of us who are in these prominent roles 
to want to be seen, to want to be applauded, to want to be appreciated, to hear, at a boy, at a girl. Right, and that, that lives in the Pharisees, but it's not just the Pharisees. It's, it lives, some, to some degree, it lives in me. And I dare say it might live in you, in your circles, or circus. So reputation is what people think we are. Character is what God knows we are, Warren Wiersbe said. Reputation is what people think we are. Character is what God knows we are. So our our character is of far more importance than our reputation or ability. Sign number three, I got a motor here. Sign number three, an unclean heart. They love a show of holiness but bring defilement on others, verse 44. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. What's Jesus saying here? This is a word picture. He calls the Pharisees unmarked graves. So so what does that mean? In their day, all of the graves would have been clearly marked because to come in contact with a grave would make one ceremonially unclean. You don't want to stumble upon a grave because then you become unclean. You have to go through the ceremonial washings and the cleansing. By calling them unmarked graves, Jesus is saying that other people who come in contact with the Pharisees are defiled by them because the Pharisees are unclean. See, I'm not sure Jesus could have offended the Pharisees more than what he is doing right here. Right? Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, Jesus said. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, that is a follower, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Wow. Like you proclaim yourself to be clean, and yet you are unclean, and those who come in contact with you, those who are touched by your teaching, those who are touched by your filth, you make them filthy as well, and you make them twice the child of hell as you are. Now, now that speaks volumes to the damage that this religious, pharisaical character can have if we don't kill it, wherever it lives within us. So by the stench of their hypocrisy, the Pharisees defiled everything and everyone that they came in contact with. And the irony is that they thought they were the most clean. Now, in verse 45, a a bold but maybe not so wise lawyer spoke up. (laughs) Teacher, you, you, (laughs) what you're saying is offending us scribes, us lawyers too. And so Jesus turns his direction to him. Woe to you too, lawyers. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Sign number four of an unclean heart. They lack. Now here we we saw with the Pharisees, it's, it's what they were loving was the problem. They loved themselves. They loved the best seat. They, they loved to be seen by others. They loved the showtime religion. He turns to the scribes, the lawyers. He says, here's what you lack. So, so like the scribes would have interpreted the law. The Pharisees would have enforced it. Right? So, so here he turns to the scribes, those of you who are interpreting the law. He says, you lack spiritual care and compassion, verse 46. And he said, woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. False religion and legalism only serve to add to people's burdens and possesses zero power to relieve burdens. The law reveals to us how sinful and guilty we are in the eyes of God. It has no power to remove our sin and our guilt and our shame. The law, you you obeying, me obeying, all the rules in the world that, that are written cannot cleanse us from our sin cannot appease the wrath of God against us, cannot cannot put us in right standing with the Lord. Jesus alone does that through his compassionate sacrifice of laying down his life for you and for me and for the whole world. 
Right? Romans 8, 3, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Like the law could not do this, folks, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus did that. So it's not about what you and I do. It's about what Jesus has already done. That's where it begins. These lawyers were known for heaping heavy legal requirements on people and never bothering to help lift a burden. But Jesus, on the other hand, gives a welcome invitation, right? The one that came to my mind is, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Like you're loaded down. You're, you're, you're under the weight and the pressure of law and sin. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Sign number five of an unclean heart. They lack spiritual life and wisdom, verses 47 through 51. Woe to you, for you you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, For they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, also, the wisdom of God. What a a beautiful name for Jesus, right? The wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of them, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. They lack spiritual life and wisdom. Scribes and Pharisees, they have no spiritual compassion because they have no spiritual life in them. What's in them is death. What does it mean that your fathers killed the prophets and you build their tombs? Well, well, they set up monuments paying tribute to the prophets of Israel, claiming claiming had had they been alive, had these Pharisees or scribes been alive in that day, they would have never killed the prophets. And yet Jesus... Messiah is right there, and they are about to kill him. It is in their heart. It is in their heart. We'll see at the end of the text, it's in their heart to kill him. And yet they claim, had we been alive, we would not have been like our forefathers. We would not have killed the prophets of Israel because we're different. They were blind. They were blind. Jesus says, you are no different than your ancestors because you have it in your heart to kill me. And those who lack spiritual life and wisdom are blind guides who are full of themselves. Sign number six of an unclean heart, verse 52. Right? Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering They lack spiritual truth and integrity. They don't have spiritual power and they don't have spirit because they don't have spiritual life, because they don't recognize spiritual truth. The truth is standing in front of them and they do not recognize him. These claiming to be wise teachers are in reality false teachers who are void of the Spirit of God and blinded by Satan. They twist and they distort the word of God to the destruction of all who hear and heed their teaching. These scribes convinced the people that nobody could understand the word of God without their interpretation and instruction. Beware, friends, of people who want to take the word of God and look at you and say, there's no way you can understand this like I can. Oh, run for your life. Run for your life from people like that. You say, I have the market cornered on the, the Word of God and its interpretation. Well, well, the Holy Spirit said through Peter, the Word of God, the interpretation of the Word of God is not a private interpretation. The Holy Spirit enlightens, illuminates our eyes, our hearts to see the Word of God. You can be every bit of a student of this book as I can or anybody else if you so choose to do that and to apply yourself to it. 
This is arrogance, what they are teaching. Uh, Lastly, we see the response, verses 53 and 54. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So, So when their hypocrisy, when the light of the truth, when Jesus shines that light on their hypocrisy, on, their, on what's inside of them, right? How do they respond? They press him hard. The word press means to bear a grudge against, to hold in hostility. They become hostile towards Jesus, and they provoke him. They begin to ask him questions, provocative questions designed to trap him in his words, so that they can kill him. How do we know they want to kill him? Well, the words lying, verse 54, lying in wait for him and to to catch him in something he might say. Lying and catch, those are hunting words. So for you hunters who are out there shooting deer, right? These are, you're lying in wait, waiting to catch that poor innocent animal, (laughs) just trying to feed itself. You're just like those Pharisees. Oh, well, <laughs> just kidding. I'm, ki- I'm totally kidding. I hope you know that. <laughs> that was not in my notes. I should just stick to my notes. This is why we know that they're, they want to put Jesus to death. They're lying in wait, waiting to trap him, to catch him in something he says so that they can accuse him and bring him before the authorities to put him to death. So, friends, maybe the Lord is confronting your heart, my heart, my heart this morning. Are you living in the truth, in the authentic you? Right? Are, are you living in some stained glass masquerade? This is the song I thought of. I mean, I'm not going to play the song, but I will share the lyrics with you. It's a Casting Crown song that came to my mind. But I wonder if there's something that the Spirit of God has exposed within you or within me in this text today. That Jesus is shining the light there and saying, come clean. Come clean with me. Confess your sins to one another. Maybe you have a close circle, a friend that you, you can trust in, that you can share what's going on inside of you. Because there's something powerful about outing ourselves and calling other people to to walk with us in accountability and to pray with us. Someone who won't condemn or judge, but someone who will listen, someone who will be wise in the word of God to say, you know what? God can forgive that. God can forgive it, and he can, and he will if we'll confess it. Jesus would have forgiven the Pharisees and the scribes had they responded as a child with humility. He would have forgiven them just as he forgave so many others who came to him for for physical healing and he forgave their sins because of their faith. So do you and I have faith to believe? So the, the lyric to the song is powerful. Is there anyone that fails? Is there anyone that falls? Am I the only one in church today feeling so small? Because when I take a look around, everybody seems so strong. I know they'll soon discover that I don't belong. So I tuck it all away like everything's okay. If I make them all believe it, maybe I'll believe it too. So with a painted grin... I play the part again so everyone will see me the way that I see them. Is there anyone who's been there? Are there any hands who raise? Am I the only one who's traded in the altar for a stage? The performance is convincing and we know every line by heart. Only when no one is watching can we really fall apart. 
Or would it set me free if I dared to let you see the truth behind the person that you imagine me to be? Or would your arms be open? Or would you walk away? Or would the love of Jesus be enough to make you stay? And then the chorus, are we happy plastic people under shiny plastic steeples with walls around our weakness? But if the invitation's open to every heart that has been broken, maybe then we close the curtain on the stained glass masquerade. It's challenging, isn't it? This word is challenging us today. So just rip away the facade, to rip away the masks. And to first and foremost meet Jesus. And he meets us right where we are. We think, we think the Lord's grace can't reach that deep. No, friends, it will reach as deep as you've gone, as deep as I've gone. His grace reaches. The outstretched arm of the Lord is not slack. It's not lacking in power. So there are two questions that hang over the life of every person in this room this morning. Number one, am I loved for who I really am? Not, not for who you think I am or for who you want me to be or for who I want to be. Am I loved for who I really am? The God of the universe is ready to meet you right where you are in your true, authentic you. And if you'll come to him and you'll humble yourself and you'll, you'll go, hit your knees and cry out to God, God has promised I'll meet you there, and I'll love you where you are, and I'll rescue you. The second question is, if I am who I truly am, that is, if I live as I truly am, will I belong here? If, if you knew the real me, if I knew the real you, if people around you knew the real you, would you belong, or would you be outcast? Will I be accepted or will I be too much for some and not enough for others? See, these two questions hang over every one of our lives. Am I loved and will I belong? If there's any doubt in our hearts about whether we're truly loved for who we are or whether we will truly belong here if people really knew us, then we'll keep the walls up around our weakness and we'll keep plastering on fake smiles every time we come here. And we'll keep pretending like we've got it all together because that's how we see each other. Look around you, friends. Look around you right now. Just, just scan the room. The people around you, the man standing in front of you, not a single one of us have it all together. Not a single one of us has all of our stuff lined up and we got it together. So this stage and this church, it's not for performance. It's not for show. This stage is an altar for broken people who are in process of being restored. That's, that's true of every person that stands up here. So don't, don't put us on a pedestal. I've told you many times, I stand on a raised platform because of this, not because of this. It's this that we want elevated. It's Christ that we want to be preeminent. This is a mess. This is still in process of being restored. And everyone else who stood up here this morning, I will speak for them. They are all in process. And any other Sunday. So this, this platform is an altar. Not for perfect people but for broken people being made new. Where are you at in that process this morning? Wherever the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, would you, would you bend your heart to him? Would you yield your heart and trust in him and come and lay it down? Now, there's going to be folks outside, outside these doors right here that would pray with you if you want someone to pray with you. You can look at a friend next to you and bring them to the altar with you and just lay down whatever. It might, have, it might have nothing to do with what the Word of God has talked about this morning, okay? 
So, so those of us who aren't responding, we're not judging those who are coming forward. Actually, when, when we come forward and we respond to the Spirit's moving, man, is that such an encouragement to everyone else around you. It's such an encouragement. But don't do it for show. Do it because the Spirit of God is drawing you. Father, we pray this morning, and we ask humbly that you would do your work as only you can during this invitation time. And Father, help us to confront what is earthly in us. Wherever the Spirit of God is exposing us right now in our own hearts and minds, oh, Father, we pray that we would come clean. And, and by coming clean, we just come to you, Lord. And maybe, maybe, maybe some of us need to come clean to a friend. We need to confess to a friend. Maybe some of us have broken relationships that need to be restored, that need to be made right. Oh, Father, would you, give us, would you give us the inclination, the power to do that? Not to be seen of people, but Father, but because we want to honor you and live for you because we love you. And so do your work as only you can in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.